So we've talked a bit about the carbon R group now, how that carbon-oxygen double bond is polarized, and what that means for reactivity. We've seen that the carbon R carbon is electrophilic and will react with nucleophiles, as shown here. And we're getting accustomed to the idea that many carbonyl compounds have this double life as an enol, a structural isomer called a tautomer, which looks like this, and reacts like this, as a nucleophile via its alpha carbon with electrophiles like bromine and alkyl halides. But what if we combine these two modes of reaction? A carbonyl group in its keto form as electrophile, with an enol or enolate as nucleophile. Well, this opens a whole new mode of reaction, and it's a reaction that's vitally important, both in organic chemistry and in biochemistry too, because this sort of reaction underpins a whole lot of carbohydrate metabolism. So let's look at it in a bit more detail. Let's start by looking at one of the simplest carbonyl compounds, the aldehyde ethanol, also known as acetaldehyde. Well, first we need to generate the enol from our carbonyl compound. Ethanol has enolizable protons on the alpha carbon. That's the carbon right next door to the carbonyl group. So under the right circumstances, it can give rise to an enol form. Remember, this isomerization is catalyzed by acid, as shown here. It involves protonation on the oxygen, followed by removal of that alpha hydrogen. The reaction is also catalyzed by base, and under normal circumstances, whatever catalyst you're using, the equilibrium lies very much to the left. Now, if this enol reacts as a nucleophile and attacks a second molecule of acetaldehyde, we can push curly arrows like this. This leads to formation of a new carbon-carbon bond between the alpha carbon of the enol reaction partner and the carbonyl carbon of the keto or aldehyde reaction partner. Also, and this bit is potentially confusing at first glance, the carbonyl group of the enol partner is regenerated, while the keto partner gives rise to an OH group, since it has formed a new bond to the incoming nucleophile. Note that the product of this reaction is both an aldehyde and an alcohol, and it's a combination of these two names that means this reaction is called the aldol reaction. The reaction can stop here with this beta hydroxyaldehyde. However, it's also possible for this compound to undergo an elimination reaction, losing water to generate an enone. Note that the new carbon carbon double bond in the alkene product is conjugated with the carbon oxygen double bond, which gives it greater stability and helps drive this reaction. The elimination step can occur under either acidic or basic conditions. Under acid catalysis, think of protonating on oxygen and losing water in an E1 process. Under basic catalysis, think about an E1CB reaction, whereby an alpha proton is lost first, and then hydroxide expelled as a leaving group. The loss of water in this second step means that the aldol reaction is sometimes referred to as a condensation reaction, or the aldol condensation. Enolates are also excellent nucleophiles. Remember that we form the enolate by deprotonating the parent carbonyl compound, removing that alpha hydrogen with strong base to generate an anion, which we can show either as a carb anion with the negative charge localized on the alpha carbon or with that negative charge on the oxygen in this resonance canonical. Imagine that enolate reacting as a nucleophile with the parent aldehyde. The initial product is an alkoxide anion, which can pick up a proton on workup to give the aldol product, and also go on to eliminate water under acidic or basic conditions to make the enone. Now, things can get a bit messy when we have two different carbonyl compounds coming together for aldol chemistry. Consider this reaction of ethanol with acetone. Well, each of these compounds can generate an enol. And each of those enols could react with either of the parent carbonyl compounds. 
That means we can potentially form four different products from this combination of reagents, as shown here. They're all beta hydroxyaldehydes, or ketones, and they derive from different combinations of the two carbonyl precursors, as indicated by the color coding. It is often more productive to use one reaction partner that cannot give rise to an enol, such as formaldehyde, benzaldehyde, acetophenone, or pivalaldehyde. In all these cases, there are no alpha hydrogens to be removed, so none of these guys can form enols or enolates, which simplifies our situation. Remember, too, that aldehydes are generally more reactive electrophiles than ketones for a combination of steric and electronic reasons that we've discussed previously. So combining a non-enolizable aldehyde with a ketone reaction partner, it becomes possible to have quite a selective aldol reaction, as shown here, to give, hopefully, a single aldol or enone product. Another way to make the reaction more selective is to do it intramolecularly, i.e. by having both the keto and enol reaction partners within the same molecule. This is a great way to make new rings. Look at this example and consider deprotonating alpha to the side chain carbonyl group to give the enolate shown in pink. Now envisage an aldol reaction between that enolate and the ketone colored orange, as shown here. This forms a new ring, and initially an alkoxide species, which can protonate and eliminate water to give the enone product shown. One more thing. You'll remember that aldehydes and ketones are not the only carbonyl compounds that can form enols or enolates. Esters can do it too, as shown here. The protonating alpha to the carbonyl group gives us an enolate, which we can draw either as a carb anion or the resonance contributor with the negative charge on the oxygen. This means that esters can also undergo a reaction that's similar to the aldol. Have a look at this sequence. The enolate generated from this ester can react with another molecule of the parent ester in a fairly familiar way. It's the classical reaction of a nucleophile with an ester, and therefore gives rise to a tetrahedral intermediate in the first instance. Now this tetrahedral intermediate, as they are prone to do, can collapse, expelling ethoxide and reforming that carbonyl group on the left of the molecule. That means our product is a beta keto ester, i.e. an ester with a carbonyl group at the beta position relative to the car ester carbonyl. Contrast this to the product of the aldol reaction, which is our beta hydroxyaldehyde. For the record, the reaction on the left here of an ester enolate with an ester carbonyl compound has its own special name. After the chemist who first discovered it, this is known as the Kleisen condensation. Incidentally, you might recognize that name. He also studied pericyclic reactions, and there's a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement named after him as well, the Kleisen rearrangement. Chemically, it's very different, but the name is rather similar. And on the right, of course, the combination of an aldehyde-derived enolate or ketone-derived enolate with an aldehyde or ketone is the classic aldol reaction. You might be interested to know that there are a number of other reactions which follow similar mechanisms to the aldol and Kleisen condensations. And for historical reasons, most of these reactions have their own unique names too, which can make things a little bamboozling. For example, the reaction of an enol nucleophile with an imine or a mini-imine electrophile involves essentially the same curly arrow sequence as the aldol reaction. Remember that C double bond N behaves very much like C double bond O in most circumstances. This is known as the Mannich reaction and leads to the formation of a beta amino aldehyde or ketone. Or it's possible to deprotonate alpha to a nitro group and give something that looks very much like an enolate anion if you use your imagination. This can then attack a carbonyl electrophile and a reaction that looks a lot like the aldol again. In this context, we call it the Henry reaction, and the product looks like this. Focus on understanding the mechanistic concepts that underpin all of these reactions, rather than the different names and traditions, and you'll be all right. That's more than enough for now. We'll discuss these and other related ideas further in class. 
and of course you can read more in the recommended texts.